Of all the Sahaba that we have spoken about and all the Sahaba that we're going to be talking about in these sessions on the Shining Stars, Sa'ad bin Mu'adh radiallahu ta'ala anhu is the Sahaba that we have the most narrations about. There's a lot of narrations about Sa'ad bin Mu'adh radiallahu ta'ala anhu. So it is most likely <coughs> that we may continue talking about him tomorrow as well, inshallah. And tomorrow is Abdullah bin Jahash radiallahu anhu. So as soon as we finish Sa'ad bin Mu'adh radiallahu anhu, then we can continue with Abdullah bin Jahash. There's not a whole lot of narrations on Abdullah bin Jahash, so inshallah, hopefully we'll be able to um, finish it off by tomorrow. Sa'ad bin Mu'adh radiallahu ta'ala anhu, great sahabi of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa And really, regarding all the sahaba, Ridwan Allah Majma'i, no matter how much we say about them, it's impossible to really do justice to their status and their rank in the eyes of Allah and His Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam but Sa'ad bin Mu'adh radiallahu ta'ala anhu was on a whole different level altogether whole different level altogether he was like the Abu Bakr Siddiq or the Umar Farooq of the Ansar that was his level if he had lived long enough as Abu Bakr Siddiq and Umar Farooq did, who were there with Rasulullah Sallallahu Wasallam from the time of the prophethood all the way until their own death. Because of that, there's so much narrations about Abu Bakr Siddiq and Umar Farooq that if you were to start talking about them, you can go on for days and days and days. But Sa'ad bin Mu'adh radiallahu ta'ala who was from the Ansar, he accepted Islam shortly before the migration. And he lived only till the five, fifth year of Hijrah, which is uh, in the Battle of the Trench, which is literally no more than five, six years of time with Rasulullah Sallallahu And despite that, we have so many narrations on him. If he had lived throughout Rasulullah Sallallahu Wasallam's prophethood, we would understand better his rank that he would be equivalent to Abu Bakr Siddiq or Umar Farooq radiallahu ta'ala anhu, at least amongst the Ansar. This was his rank, this was his level, the number of narrations that I've read about him, and the numerous virtues and excellences that are mentioned by different Sahaba about him are just amazing. He was very much unlike Abdullah bin Hudhaf. Abdullah bin Hudhaf, as we met, mentioned, was a somewhat of a humor and like to make people laugh. Sa'ad bin Mu'adh, his personality was just like that of Umar Farooq. Almost exactly the same. In fact, in the Battle of Badr, when it came time to consult with the Sahaba Ridwan Allah about what to do with the captives in the Battle of Badr that were caught by the Muslimin, all the Sahaba from the Muhajireen and the Ansar for different reasons said that Ya Rasulullah you should let them go if their ransom is paid let their ransom be paid and you can send them back home two people disagreed only two from 313 Sahaba who to participate in the Battle of Badr those who remained alive after the Battle of Badr only two said something different and those were number one Umar Farooq radiallahu ta'ala anhu and number two Sa'ad bin Mu'adh they said Ya Rasulullah kill them kill both all of the captives because if you don't tomorrow they'll come back to haunt us again in the next battle and indeed that's what happened they came back in the battle of Uhud then they came back in the battle of the trench many of them and caused much harm to the Muslimin, killed many Sahaba Ridwan Allah Majmain, and of course put Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam through much difficulty. And that's why inshallah when we'll read about the battle of the trench and what decision Sa'ad bin Mu'adh radiallahu ta'ala anhu made in that after the battle of the trench, you'll understand why he made that decision. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala agreed in the battle of Badr 
with the opinion of uh, Umar Farooq عن, and Sa'ad bin Mu'ad and to the extent that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the ayah of Quran Hakim that if it had not been decreed beforehand the time of every person's death Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would have sent an azab for not killing the captives and letting them go for a ransom. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sided with Sa'ad bin Mu'ad and Umar Farooq radiallahu ta'ala anhuma. And that in itself tells us a lot about his rank and <coughs> that he was, his opinion was according to the revelation of the Quran Hakim. So as I was saying, he was very much like Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu. He was also very tall, just like Jarid ibn Abdullah al-Bajari. He was majestic in his personality, his character. Anybody who saw him would fall in love with him right away. When he was martyred, there was not a single person in Medina Munawwara who was not crying for him. From Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to Abu Bakr, Abu Bakr Siddiq to Umar Farooq all the way down to his own mother. Every single person was crying and inshallah we'll talk about those narrations. They loved him. They loved him because he had that type of personality that anybody who met him once would, would just become enamored by him. He had a very large frame, he was very tall, he was very handsome, he was very white. And he was the leader of the tribe of Banu Aus. There's two tribes in Medina Munawwara. One was Banu Aus and one was Banu Khazraj. These were two tribes of Medina Munawwara, the most powerful tribes after the Jews. He was the leader of the tribe of Banu Aus. Banu Aus had many different clans within it. There was a clan called Banu Abdul Ashhal. Banu Abdul Ashhal. Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam when he was grading the sahaba of the Ansar, the different tr- clans of the Ansar, that who has the highest rank. He mentioned that the highest rank is Banu Najjar and then after that Banu Abdul Ashhal in the hadith of Sahih al-Bukhari. So he was from the clan of Banu Abdul Ashhal and when he accepted Islam, his whole clan, all the children, all the women, all the men, every single person accepted Islam. Now, we should know that before Rasulullah migrated, many people had already accepted Islam, many people from different clans. But there was not a single clan in Medina Munawwara from the tribes of Banu Aus or Banu Khazraj in which there weren't some people who still hadn't accepted. Every clan, whether it was Banu Najjar, whether it was Banu Diyar, Banu Zafar, Banu Sa'ada, all the different tribes had group, had Muslims among them and they had the Mushrikeen among them. But the tribe of Banu Abdul Ashhal, every single person accepted Islam because Sa'ad bin Mu'ad radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he made it very clear that if you don't accept Islam, that I'm not, I don't want to have anything to do with any member of my clan. And because they loved him so dearly, every single person accepted Islam just on his word. This is how beloved he was. So he converted his whole tribe of Banu Abdul Ashal, his whole clan I should say, of Banu Abdul Ashal to Islam. One thing I forgot to mention, I was saying that he had a very large frame. It's mentioned that when he was going out for the battle of the trench, now, inshallah, when we make a trip to Medina Munawwara, we can see what the trench was like. Everything has been removed, but alhamdulillah, we have enough information to reconstruct what the trench was like and where the Sahaba were sitting. And it's very beautiful to know because it kind of brings back to life the history of how the whole war took place, how the whole battle took place. And that's very important for us to know because it makes the hadith related to these battles much more easier to understand. We can put them into better context. Right now I will just explain it to you as is, but once it's in front of you live, then it becomes much more clear. When he was on his way to the battle of the trench, Aisha Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala anha was standing outside and she was walking behind the people. There was a lot of people going towards the battle of the trench. She says, I saw, I heard somebody behind me like a grating sound, something being dragged on the ground. She said, I looked and I see Sa'ad bin Mu'adh walking with his sword in his hand and his armor. 
because he was so tall, the armor didn't fit him. So his forearms were exposed. And she said, I feared for him because when you're in a battle, you need to make sure that every single part is covered just in case you never know. And indeed, her fear came true because that is exactly how he died. The armor exposed, the armor didn't cover him fully, so his forearms were exposed. He got shot by an arrow in his forearm, which ruptured a vein, and he bled to death. He didn't die right away, but he did bleed to death. And that was the cause of his death. So she expressed that fear while she's narrating this hadith that I saw him in this condition, that the armor was not covering forearms. And I said to his mother that, you know, she's, he's, I said to him, Mu'adh Sa'ad, that she's, he's not covered fully. And she said to her son, he said, Ilhaq, go, 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 you're in the path of Allah. That's how the mothers in those times were. When he used to sit on a horse, his feet would touch the ground. That's how tall he was. So it's mentioned about him, min atwal nas wa He was one of the tallest and most large framed. He was not fat. He was very tall and he was large framed, very broad shouldered. Another thing about him, we're just doing a brief overview. We'll go into more details later. Rasulullah ﷺ, when he was forging ties between Muhajirin and the Ansar, we mentioned about Abbad bin Bishr radiallahu ta'ala anhu. He was from the Ansar. And Salim, Mola, Abu Hudayfa and Abu Hudayfa were from the Muhajirin. Rasulullah ﷺ forged ties between them and Abbad bin Bishr. So Abbad bin Bishr was made in charge of taking care of Salim, Mola, Abu Hudayfa and Abu uh, Hudayfa radiallahu ta'ala anhuma. Likewise, he forged ties between Sa'ad bin Mu'adh radiallahu ta'ala anhu and Abu Ubaidah ibn al-Jarrah or, there's different narrations, or Sa'ad bin Abi Waqas radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Two great Sahaba, both of them are from those Sahaba who we call the Ashara Mubashara, the ten promised ones who are granted Jannah by Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in this world. So either Abu Ubaid ibn al-Jarrah or Sa'ad, uh, or, uh, Sa'ad bin Abi Waqas radiallahu ta'ala anhuma, both of, one of these two was uh, made brother with Sa'ad bin Mu'adh radiallahu anhu. So he used to stay in his home and Sa'ad bin Mu'adh radiallahu ta'ala anhu would take care of their needs. There's one very famous Sahabi. His name is Asad ibn Zurara. Not Asad, As'ad ibn Zurara. He's better known as Abu Amama radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Our Hadith Shaykh, Shaykh al-Hadith Muhammad Zakariya rahimahullah used to pray, make dua for him a lot. Because, in fact, every, every salah he used to make dua for him because he said he taught us a dua that if, we, if it wasn't for this dua, we would be left empty-handed. He once came to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he said, Ya Rasulullah, there's so many du'as, so many du'as, so many du'as, we can't possibly memorize every single du'a. Please t tell us a du'a that sums up all the different du'as. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa taught the du'a, Allahumma inna nas'ulaka min khayri ma sa'alaka minu nabiyuka wa habibuka Sayyidina Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa na'udhu bika min sharri masta'adhaka minu nabiyuka wa habibuka Sayyidina Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam We ask from you all the good that the Blessed Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam asked from you, Ya Allah. And we seek refuge from you from all the things that the Blessed Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam sought refuge from you, Ya Allah. Now that includes every single du'a. This was a dua that was made because Abu Amama radiallahu ta'ala asked the question. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would always, uh, um, the Shaykh al-Hadith Muhammad Zakiri rahimahullah would always make dua for him. Abu Amama radiallahu ta'ala anhu. This Abu Amama also was the first person to establish Jum'ah in Medina Munawwara before the migration. Before Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam migrated to Medina Munawwara, Asa'ad ibn Zurara, Abu Mama radiyallahu anhu, would hold Juma in his house. And the person who used to lead the Juma was who? Musab ibn Umair radiyallahu ta'ala anhu. Musab ibn Umair was sent by Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to convert the people and call the people of Medina Munawwara to Islam. He used to stay in Abu Amama radiyallahu ta'ala anhu's house. And he used to lead Juma there as well. Abu Amama and Sa'ad bin Mu'adh both were brothers or cousins, because their mothers were sisters. So you could say Khala, Ibn al-Khala, right? Very close. Asad ibn al-Zurara accepted Islam first. 
Sa'ad bin Muaz was still a disbeliever and his best friend and also another cousin. We've mentioned his name a couple, not, a couple of times before when we were talking about Abbad bin Bishr. Abbad bin Bishr is from the same clan. Usaid ibn Hudayr radiallahu ta'ala anhu. We've mentioned his name a couple of times. Usaid bin Hudayr and Sa'ad bin Muaz both were very close and they were chiefs of Banu Aus, just like Abbad bin Bishr. But Sa'ad bin Muaz was at the top. Sa'ad bin Muaz and Usaid bin Hudayr accepted Islam later. Abu Amama accepted Islam earlier. He's one of the 70 people who came on the 12th year of Hijrah and made bay'ah with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in Mina. There's still a masjid there today in Mina. A very old masjid that's been made by the Turkish to uh, commemorate that bay'ah that was made between the Ansar Sahaba in the 11th year of prophethood and the 12th year of prophethood. It was called Masjid al Aqaba. There's not many people who know about it. When you go to Makkah Makarama and you visit the different sites, they won't show you that. You have to ask, I want to know where Masjid al Aqaba is, and they may take you there. Okay. That, that place is where the 70 Sahaba on the second, 12th of prophethood accepted Islam and made bear with Rasulullah. Asa'id ibn Zurara was one of them. I don't know if he was on the 11th or 12th, most likely he was on the 12th. On the first year, there was only 12. On the second year, there was, uh, second last year of the prophethood, there was 70. So when he asked Rasulullah when he made the pledge with Rasulullah can you please send somebody with you? Send somebody to come to Medina Munawwara and teach us about Islam and also convert our relatives towards the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Rasulullah chose the young Sahabi Musab ibn Umair who's only 18, 19 years old. Very, very eloquent Sahabi, very handsome young Sahabi and very charismatic. He went to Medina Munawwara and people started accepting Islam in large numbers. Once, and he was staying in Asa'id ibn Zurara, Abu Mama radiallahu house, holding Jummah there. Usaid ibn Hudayr and Sa'ad bin Mu'adh found out about it. That they're staying, that Musab ibn Amir is staying at whose house? Abu Mama radiallahu house, his cousin's house. He was very angry. So he sent Usaid bin Hudayr, go to Abu Mama and tell him to kick out Musab ibn Amir from his house. What is he doing here? He's converting all our people towards this uh, disbelief and turning them away from their gods. So Usaid ibn Hudayr came to Abu Amama radiallahu while he was sitting under a tree with Musa ibn Umar. And Usaid ibn Hudayr put a spear in the ground and he said, what is this you've started? Sa'ad bin Mu'adh has sent me to tell your friend here to get out of here and go back to his city. So Asa ibn Zarara was about to speak. Musa ibn Umar said, listen, listen to what I have to say. If you like it, accept it. If you don't like it, then I'll go. He said, that's fair. So he sat down and within a few moments, he was Muslim. He said, now what do I do? He said, go and perform your ghusl and your wudu, come back and bismillah. So Sayyid bin Hudayr radiallahu ta'ala was, had a change of heart. He came back and he said to Sa'ad bin Mu'adh that I think you should, he didn't want to say to him that accept Islam. He wanted to take him to Musab ibn Amir so he could use his special ways and you recite the ayahs of Qur'an because Usaid bin Hudayr was a new Muslim, he didn't know any ayahs of Qur'an. Musa ibn Umair knew a lot, so he wanted to take him to Musa ibn Umair, so he says to Sa'ad bin Mu'adh, he says, you know, I think you should come with me and see what he has to say. So then he takes him to Sa'ad bin, uh, to uh, Musa ibn Umair and he puts his spear down, he sits down and within a little while he's also accepted Islam. Then he comes back to his family and he says, anybody who doesn't accept Islam, I want nothing to do with him. And within a short time, the whole tribe of Banu Abdul Ashal, as I mentioned, has accepted Islam. Man, woman, child, every single person. So this is the story about his acceptance of Islam. He accepted Islam before the migration of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Before the migration of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So by the time Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi came, he, had already, he was already a Muslim and his whole tribe was already accepting Islam. He and Usaid bin Hudayr were two people who went to each and every idol in each and every house from the clan of Banu Abdul Ashal and broke every single idol. Sa'ad bin Mu'ad and Usaid bin Hudayr. These are just some few things I'm mentioning as an overview about Usaid bin Hudayr. Another, uh, sorry about Sa'ad bin Mu'ad radiallahu Sa'ad bin Mu'ad radiallahu another thing is that Throughout his time as a Muslim, 
as a Sahabi of Rasulullah he always remained in a state of having a high fever. He always had a high fever. So he was always running a fever between, we would say, 101 to 104. And the reason behind that was once he was sitting in the gathering of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam, and Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam was talking about a fever, and he was talking about how when tribulations come upon you, they're actually a means of elevating your rank and bringing you closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Or often we think that these tribulations and hardships that befall us in this dunya, they are, uh, we think of them as literally as a tribulation and we complain to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But they're literally not tribulations, they're actually blessings from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bring us closer to Him. It's a sign that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to bring us closer to Him. So when she was, he was mentioning about a fever, that this fever is also a tribulation, but actually it's a, uh, it's a blessing because whoever has this, man kanat bihi fayahalluhu minan nar, whoever has a fever, it will save him from the fire of Jahannam because the fever is a form of fire in this world of Jahannam. So when he gets in this world, he won't get it in the Akhirah. So Sa'ad radiallahu ta'ala anhu made a dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He said, Ya Rabb, I want to have a fever all the time. I want to have a fever all the time. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepted this dua and he was always in a state of fever. So when we talk about Sa'ad bin Mu'adh, keep in mind that he's in a state of fever. فَلَمْ تُفَارِقُوا حَتَّى فَارِقَ الدُّنْيَا The fever never left him until he left this world. This was the love of the Sahaba Ridwan Allah Majma'in for the, the level of their Iman, their love for Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But it tells us their level of Iman that how much fear they had for the fire of Jahannam and how much love they had for going into Jannah. It was really like it was in front of them. He was very beloved, as I was mentioning. Everyone loved him. Everyone loved him. Everyone loved him. I was talking about Usaid bin Hudayr radiallahu ta'ala anhu who was also one of the heads of the clan of Banu Abdul Ashhal. It's mentioned that once after the death of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he went for hajj with a group of Sahaba Ridwan Allah majma'in. On his way back the people from the Ansar, his tribe members came to meet him, receive him at Dhul Hulayfa. Dhul Hulayfa is a place where we, where we wear our haram when we're going towards Makkah Makarma from Medina Munawwara. So it's the miqat for the people of Medina Munawwara. So they came to meet him there outside of Medina Munawwara and to welcome him and all the different people whose family members had gone out for Hajj from the Sahaba. They were coming, they were there at Dhul Hulayfa to receive uh, their family members and welcome them and congratulate them for their Hajj. For, uh, for their for their Hajj, so when Usaid bin Hudayr radiallahu anhu came back, his clan members came and they welcomed him and kissed him and and then they told him the the sad story, the sad news that his wife had passed away, and he loved his wife a lot. So he covered his head completely. Fataqanna. He covered his head and he started to cry. Aisha Siddiqa radiallahu anha was also among those people who had gone for Hajj, so she was there. So she said to Usaid bin Hudayr, she passed a comment, she said, Ghafar Allahu laka anta sahib Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. May Allah forgive you. You are the companion of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Wa laka min as-sabiqa wal qadim malak. You know, you have such a strong relationship with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam from before the migration and after the migration. وَأَنْتَ تَبْكِي عَلَىٰ إِمْرَأَةٍ And you're crying over a woman. So Usaid bin Hudayr took off the cloth by which he was covering his head. And he said, Sadaq, do you speak the truth? La umri, I swear by my Allah, by my age. La hiqtanna, alla abki ala ahadin ba'da Sa'ad bin Mu'adh. It's really... It doesn't behoove me to cry over anybody after the death of Sa'ad bin Mu'adh. I haven't felt the grief of anyone the way I felt the grief of Sa'ad bin Mu'adh when he was martyred. 
And I remember something that Rasulullah had said about Sa'ad bin Mu'adh that whenever I think about it, I feel like crying again. So she said, what did he say? He said, I heard Rasulullah say, and there's a very famous hadith about Sa'ad bin Mu'adh radiallahu ta'ala anhu, لَقَدْ اِحْتَزَّ أَرْشُ الْعَرْشُ لِوَفَاتِ سَعَدْ بِنْ مُعَاذِ That the throne of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shook at the death of Sa'ad bin Mu'adh radiallahu ta'ala anhu. That's how great he was. That the grave of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shook on his death. There are many virtues of Sa'ad bin Mu'adh radiallahu ta'ala anhu and I'm going to mention a few as we go along. There's one hadith by Majishun rahimahullah. He says, Sa'ad bin Mu'adh radiallahu ta'ala anhu said that my iman is extremely weak. My iman is extremely weak. There's only three things that I hope for that inshallah hopefully will save me on the day of judgment. Number one, Ma samartu min Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa shay'an illa alimtu annahu haqq. I've never heard anything from the Blessed Prophet wasallam, but I believe that it was haq. Number one. Number two. La sallaytu salatan fahaddastu nafsi baghayriya hatta anfatila anha. That I never prayed salah and talked to my nafs about anything outside of the salah until I turned away from salah. In other words, his level of concentration in salah was that he was never thinking about anything but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Normally when we're praying salah, what are we doing? We're having conversations with our nafs. And it's those conversations that we are having that do not allow us to have the concentration, the khushu and khudu that we're supposed to have in salah. But Sa'ad bin Mu'adh radiallahu ta'ala is saying about himself that this is one thing I can say about myself that I don't talk to myself when I'm praying my salah and tell my salah is finished. This is how much control they had over their nafs, how much control they had over their thoughts that not a, a foreign thought would come to their mind while they were praying their salah or a whisper from shaitan even. So controlled their salah was that they were as if they were standing in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself. Third thing was I never follow a janazah a funeral, beer. فَحَدَّثْتُ نَفْسِ بِغَيْرِ مَا إِيَّهُ قَائِلْهُ وَيُقَالُ لَهَا Except that I am never thinking, con conversing with myself or having any conversation my with myself except for that which this dead body, this janazah is now saying and what is being said to it. In other words, I'm just thinking about the death and all the things that Rasulullah told us about what happens after death. A mu'min when his body goes, he says, take me quick, take me quick, take me quick. And when a disbeliever dies, he says, where are you taking me? Where are you taking me? Hadith of these type, he was thinking about these when he was going to janazah. And he would not be thinking about anything else. So his level of khushu' even when he was going with the janazah was very similar to when he was praying his salah. He says these three things are three things by which inshallah I hope that I will go to jannah. Besides that I'm very weak in my iman. When Sa'ad bin Mu'adh radiallahu ta'ala anhu became injured in the battle of the trench as we mentioned he was hit by a person named Habban ibn Araqah. He was shot from across the trench, it hit his forearm, the vein ruptured, and he was bleeding continuously. When, surah, when the Sahaba came back from the battle of the trench, and the Quraysh and Banu Ghatfa and all the different tribes that had gathered against the Sahaba and Rasulullah had left. The wind blew, it's a very long story, I'm not going to go into it, but they left after 25 to 30 days. The Sahaba were extremely tired. They had not slept for days and days because they were guarding the trench because the Quraysh and other tribes kept on trying to cover the, uh, to jump over the trench and attack. At the same time, on the other side, within Medina Munawwara, there was a tribe of Banu Quraidha. The tribe of Banu Quraidha was a Yehudi tribe that had broken its pact with the Blessed Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Rasulullah and the Sahaba were extremely fearful that 
just as how they're trying to attack from this side of the trench, from within Medina Munawwara, Banu Qurayza will attack from the other side. So we'll be sandwiched between the both. This was a constant fear. So Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, as soon as Quraysh and all the tribes left, he came back to Medina Munawwara and he was about to take off his armor when Jibreel Alayhi Salatu Salam came to him and told him that you are taking off your armor when the other an- the angels have not taken off their armor. They still have their armor on. And it's the order of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for you to go now to Banu Quraidha and besiege their fortress. Before I go on, I'll mention one very important thing. The tribe of Banu Aus, this is the tribe of Sa'ad bin Mu'adh, was an ally or called Halif of Banu Quraiza. There was many tribes amongst the Jews. There was Banu Quraiza, there was Banu Nadir. Banu Quraiza and Banu Nadir. Banu Nadir was the tribe that was allied with the other tribe of the Mushrikeen, Banu Khazraj. And Banu Aus was the tribe that was allied with Banu Quraiza. Many years before this incident of the Battle of the Trench, Banu Nadir had been exiled by Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam wanted to execute them because they had broken their pact with Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. But the tribe of Banu Khazraj came to Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, the Sahaba, and said, "Ya Rasulullah, please let them go." One of the people from that tribe of Banu Khazraj was Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Sulul, the hypocrite. So he was from an ally of the tribe of Banu Khazraj. He came and a group of Sahaba came from Banu Khazraj and said, Ya Rasulullah, please don't do anything to them. Just exile them. Let them go. So Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi let them go and they moved. They were all exiled and they went to Khaybar. Now was Banu Quraidha's turn and they were the allies with Banu Aus. When Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi came back from the battle of the trench, Sa'ad bin Mu'adh radiallahu anh, did not go with everyone because his Injury was so severe. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa told the Sahaba to pitch a tent for him inside Masjid al-Nabwi so that he could visit him at all times. So it was the habit of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa during the salawat, he would come and he would ask him, Kayf asbahta, kayf amsayta, how are you doing? How are you feeling? He would constantly visit him day, and day in the morning and once in the night. So there's a lot of narrations about some of the things that occurred while Rasulullah came to visit Sa'ad bin Mu'adh that tell us his extremely high rank. One such incident is that Sa'ad bin Mu'adh radiallahu ta'ala anhu, when his vein ruptured, Rasulullah gave the order to have it cauterized. We mentioned that how the, that Rasulullah didn't like this as a treatment But because his situation had become so bad Rasulullah gave the order It was cauterized And that healed the wound for a short while So he was staying inside this tent Inside Masjid Nabwi And there was another khayma Another tent beside his Of the tribe of Banu Ghifar And they saw blood pouring into their tent One day And they said where is this blood coming from And then Someone told them that maybe this is coming from Sa'ad bin Mu'adh because he's been sick. Maybe that vein has ruptured again. And indeed it had ruptured. They came and they saw that he was bleeding. They immediately came and informed Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Now this narration is regarding Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam. As he came into the tent, he came to him, he took his head and he put it in his lap. وَسُجِّيَ بِثَوْبٍ أَبْيَضَ إِذَا مُدَّ عَلَى وَجْهِ خَرَجَتْ رِجْلَاهُ he was covered with a blanket, with a cloth that was white. And he was so tall that if it was used to cover his head, it would not cover his feet. And if it covered his feet, it wouldn't cover his head. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he made a dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He said, Allahumma inna sa'adan qad jahada fi sabilik, wa saddaqa rasulak, wa qada alladhi alayhi, fa taqabbal ruhahu bi khayri ma taqabbal da bihi ruhan. Oh Allah, Sa'ad, he struggled in your path. He accepted your Prophet and followed him all the way. And he fulfilled all the duties that were put upon him. Please accept his soul in the best way that you would accept the soul of anyone. This was the dua that Rasulullah made for him. When Sa'ad, who was in a state of semi-consciousness, heard this, 
he woke up, he opened his eyes, and he said, Assalamu alaikum, Ya Rasulullah. Salam be upon you, Ya Rasulullah. Ama inni ashhadu anna ka Rasulullah. I bear witness that you are a Rasul of Allah. When the family of Sa'ad came to visit, the tribe of Banu Abdul Hashir didn't live nearby Madina Munawwara, uh, live near Masjid al Nabawi. The area of Masjid al Nabawi today was the location of the tribe of Banu Najjar, Abu Ayyub and Sa'di radiallahu anhu. Banu Abdul Hashir lived a little far away. So when they came on at that time to visit uh, Sa'ad bin Mu'adh radiallahu ta'ala anhu, and they saw that Rasulullah was holding him in his lap, they got scared. They were terrified that this means that he's in his last moments. So they're extremely terrified. So somebody came to Rasulullah and told Rasulullah Ya Rasulullah, the, tribe, uh, the clan of Banu Abdul Ashal just saw his head is in your lap. And because of that, they were so terrified that they went away. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, يَسْتَأْذِنُ اللَّهُ مِنْ مَلَائِكَتِهِ عَدَدُكُمْ فِي الْبَيْتِ لِيَشْهَدُ وَفَاتَ سَعَدِ Angels equivalent to the amount of people in the tribe, in the clan of Banu Abdul Ashal came to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and asked for permission so that they could be present at the time of the death of Sa'ad bin Mu'adh radiallahu ta'ala anhu. They took permission from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How many? the same amount as there were in the clan of Banu Abdul Ashhar. During that time, when this news reached the mother, she started crying. And she read a poem, a very beautiful poem. She said, وَيْلُ أُمِّ سَعَدٍ سَعَدٍ جَلَادَةً وَجِدًّا May woe be to Umm Sa'ad for Sa'ad, that he always was meticulous in his ways, and he was always strong on the deen, and he struggled in the path. Umar ibn Khattab who was sitting there and he said, Mahalan ya Umm Sa'ad. He knew that Rasulullah didn't like it when uh, people recited poetry because he had, there was a whole uh, surah revealed about the shu'ara, surah shu'ara, in which uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala condemns the poetry and the people who recite poetry. So Umar ibn Khattab thinking that Rasulullah would not like this poetry, he said to her, Mahalan, stop this, Umm Sa'ad, stop this. La tathkuri, stop. And Rasulullah said, Mahalan ya Umar, let her alone. Let her alone. For kullu baqihi mukadhibatun. Anybody who's ever cried has lied. Illa Umm Sa'ad, except Umm Sa'ad. Her crying is true. Her crying is true. Ma qalat min khayrin, falam takthib. Whatever she's saying, she's saying the truth and she's saying the best and she's not lying. Whatever she's saying, she's saying the truth. Indeed, Sa'ad bin Mu'adh radiallahu anhu was a man who struggled in the path and he fulfilled the wa'ada, the promises that he made with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Another hadith about him. An angel came to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa In some rawayat it's mentioned that it was Jibreel alayhi salam and some it just says the word malak. An angel came to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in the night when he was sleeping in his dream. And he said, Man rajula min ummatik mata laylatan istabshar bimauti ahlus sama. Who is the person that has just died last night? The people in the sky, the beings in the sky, I should say, the beings in the sky are congratulating each other because he's left this world and he has gone to them now. So they're so happy because that soul, this very beautiful soul that is accepted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has gone up to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is now with them. So who is it that the, the Ahlus Sama, the, the beings of the sky are bearing glad tidings and congratulating each other for it? So he said, La alam, I don't know, except uh, Sa'ad has been very sick for a couple of days. When he woke up, he said, Ma fa'ala Sa'ad. They said, Ya Rasulullah, he just passed away. He just passed away. And they took him. After he passed away, his family members came and took him back to the, where the clan of Banu Abdul Ashal was settled. Rasulullah came in the morning to lead his Salatul Janaza. And when he went to the place of Jannatul Baqi to lead his Salatul Janaza, he was going so fast that the Sahaba were unable to catch up with him. The Sahaba couldn't catch up with him. 
to the extent that one Sahabi says he was going so fast that our sandals were about to break and the shawls on our back came off because we were running practically. So we said, Ya Rasulullah, qad batta tannas, you have tired out the people. Ya Rasulullah, you've tired out the people. Go a little slower, Ya Rasulullah. He said, Inni akhsha an tasbiqana ilayhi al malaika kama sabakatna ila hanzala. I fear that the angels will reach Sa'ad bin Mu'ad first and pray his Salatul Janazah before us. I want to get there before, before they do. Because they reached Hanzala before we did and they prayed their Salatul Janazah and washed him. I don't want them to do that this time. We want to get to Sa'ad bin Mu'ad first. Hanzala is called Ghasilul Malaika. And it's known about him that the Malaika, the angels had washed his body. So Rasulullah said, I'm scared that the angels will get to Sa'ad bin Mu'ad first. We must get to him first and read the Salatul Janazah before the angels do. This is telling you the rank of Sa'ad bin Mu'ad. Why did he gain this rank? They will tell you some incidents of how he gained this rank. His level of Iman, inshallah, we'll talk about that later. There's one Sahabi. On the days, during the days when he was sick, and Rasulullah would visit him every day, a Sahabi says, I came. Salama ibn Aslam ibn Hadith. He said, I saw Rasulullah wasallam, him entering, and we were standing at the door, and we saw Rasulullah go inside the house. But when he entered the house, there was nobody in there except Sa'ad bin Waz laying on the ground on his bed. And that's it. And Rasulullah now entered. But the way in which Rasulullah entered, he was as if he was jumping over people. As if he was jumping over people. You know how there is a group of, a very big crowd of people, how you try to make your way slowly to get to wherever you want to get to, like the middle of the gathering. So Rasulullah wasallam to get to Sa'ad bin Mu'adh was kind of maneuvering around, jumping here and there. So Rasulullah, they were about to enter in and Rasulullah wasallam gestured towards them, stay, stay, stay. So he said, I stood there and then I came back. A little while later I came back again and Rasulullah was just about leaving the tent. I said, Ya Rasulullah, ma ra'itu ahadan wa qad ra'aytuka takhatta. You entered into the house, into the tent and there was nobody there. Why were you like walking that way as if there were so many people? Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, ma qadartu ala majlisin hatta qabada li malakatum min al malaika ahadu janahayhi fajalastu. I did not have any room to sit until one of the angels wrapped its wings to make space for me to sit and then I sat down. In other words, there was a gathering of angels sitting around Sa'ad bin Mu'adh radiallahu ta'ala anhu. So when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam came in, there was no space for him. When he came in, the angel saw one of them wrapped its wing or folded its wing. And then Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa came and sat. Imagine, a sahabi of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, who was so amazing, such a high rank, that the gathering of the angels would be, there would be a gathering of angels around him. And he was sick. He was unconscious. And in a state of a fever. But the angels loved him so much. When they were taking him to his grave, one of the people who dug his grave was Abu Sa'id al-Khudri radiallahu ta'ala. By the way, in Jannatul Baqiyah, I've mentioned before, there are many, many, many Sahaba buried there. Some say over 10,000 Sahaba. Imam Malik said there's over 10,000 Sahaba buried in Jannatul Baqiyah. And we don't know the location of all the Sahaba, where they're buried, which Sahabi is buried where. But we do know exactly where Sa'ad bin Mu'adh radiallahu is buried. His grave is marked with four walls around it and it's separate from all the others and it's very close to where Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu ta'ala who is buried but more towards the north more towards the north his grave is separate 
people go there, they don't know who, are, who they're making their Surah Fatiha, sending the Isa al-Thawab of their Surah Fatiha to. But that Sa'ad bin Mu'ad radiallahu ta'ala, who was buried there. Inshallah, when we go, we will visit him there, inshallah. But remember, you don't have to visit him to send the rewards of your good deeds. You can recite Surah Fatiha right from here and send the reward of that to them. To all the Sahabah Ridwan Allah he says, Abu Sayyid Khudri Zidhan, that when we were digging his grave, when we were digging his grave in Jannatul Baqiya, every time we lifted the dirt, we kept on smelling the fragrance of musk coming from the dirt, even though he hasn't even been buried in there yet. But just because it was chosen to be the grave of Sa'ad bin Mu'adh right from that point on when they started digging it all the dirt that came out of it it was smelling like musk who's saying this? Abu Sayyid Khudri radiallahu kullama hafarna qataratan min turabin hatta intahina ila lahad for each and every shovel full of dirt that we took out there would be a smell of musk coming out all the way until we reached the bottom and we put, made the niche, the lahad, the niche to put him in. There were four people who put him in his grave. One of them was Usaid bin Hudayr and three of the others, the names we don't know. I mean, their names are mentioned, but most of us don't know him. It was Harith radiallahu anhu and Abu Naila, Silkan ibn Salama and Salma ibn Salama. These four sahaba were from the clan of Banu Abdul Ashhal. Abu Naila is also a very famous sahaba. It's mentioned that after... Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the Sahaba put him in the grave and they covered it up. <sighs> Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's face color changed. The color of his face changed. And he said something. He said, first he said, Subhanallah, really loud. And because of that, all the Sahaba repeated after him, Subhanallah, until the whole of Jannatul Baqi resounded with the sound of Subhanallah. And then he said, Alhamdulillah. And then everyone said, Alhamdulillah. And it resounded with the sound of Alhamdulillah. And then Allahu Akbar. And then after he was finished, the Sahaba came to Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. They said, Ya Rasulullah, why did you say that? Why did you say Subhanallah, Alhamdulillah, Allahu Akbar? You usually don't do that. He said, لَوْ نَجَا أَحَدٌ مِّن دَغْدَةِ الْقَبْرِ لَنَجَا سَعَدٌ If there was anyone who'd be saved from the narrowness of the grave, it would be Sa'ad. Because when a person is put in his grave, the grave wants to destroy him and crush him. If there was anyone who could be saved from the narrowness of the grave, it would be Sa'ad. وَلَقَدْ ضُمَّ ضَمَّةً he was, he was, the grave was narrowed for him. اِخْتَلَفَتْ مِنْهَا أَضْلَعُهُ Until his ribs went into each other. مِنْ أَثَرِ الْبَوْلِ Because one time, one time he was not careful when some splatter from urine came on him. Splatter of urine. That's all it was. But when Rasulullah said, Subhanallah, Alhamdulillah, Allahu Akbar, by the barakah of his saying Subhanallah and the Sahaba saying Subhanallah, Alhamdulillah, Allahu Akbar, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala relieved that and it came back to its normal width. But imagine a person, the level of Sa'ad bin Mu'adh radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Because of this issue of urine splattering over him at one time and he may have not been careful in that that this issue happened this is a sign for us to be very very careful tahara is very important this is the key to all our ibadat you do tawaf you have to have wudu you want to pray salah you have to have wudu Just about every main ibadah you want to do, you have to have tahara. And tahara means not just wudu, being pure of any type of 
impurity, whether it's physical impurity or spiritual impurity. In this case, we're talking about physical impurity. Another thing that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa said while his janazah was being taken, while his janazah was being taken, he was a very big man as we mentioned, and inshallah we'll finish with this and then we'll continue tomorrow. When his janazah was being taken, his body was very big, so his coffin, his, his coffin should have been very, very heavy. But in reality, his coffin was very, very light. So the Sahaba even mentioned it to Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. They said, Ya, Allah, ya Rasulullah, ma khaffa. How light his coffin is. So there were some hypocrites sitting in the, standing in the back, walking with the procession as well. Hypocrite is a hypocrite. He's going to say things that show and expose his kufr. They said, yeah, because of that decision that he made. What is that decision that he made? Inshallah, we'll talk about that tomorrow. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, was he informed? When he was informed of that, he said no. He said 70,000 angels, 70,000 angels came. Sab'una alfan, malikin, shahidu janazah sa'adin. 70,000 angels came to attend the janazah of Sa'ad radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And these were such angels, ma wati'ul arda qabl al yom. They have never come down upon the earth before this. And they were helping carrying the janazah of Sa'ad bin Mu'adh radiallahu ta'ala anhu. That's why it was so light, like a paper. Felt like a paper. Like, why is it so light? So Rasulullah said, this is why it's so light. There's much, much more about Sa'ad bin Mu'adh radiallahu anhu. Today we just talked about his virtues. But how did he gain this level that Rasulullah said all these things about him? Inshallah, we'll talk about that. We'll talk about the decision that he made. What was that decision? It was a very important decision that he made. Inshallah, tomorrow. Subhana rabbika rabbil izzati amma yasifun wa salamun ala al-muslim. Alhamdulillah rabbil